My name is Benjamin Thompson and today I'll be going through recitation worksheet 17 for Math 1106. This worksheet has three questions and all of them are related to finding equilibrium points and stability. So let's begin. So in question one, we're given a population model of mice which have uh, a new gene and then we're asked several questions about what happens to the fraction of mice that have this gene over time. So in part A, we're asked to find two things. We're asked to find the equilibrium points of the model and determine the stability of these things. To do the second part, we typically need to do the first part. So let's begin with that. In order to find the equilibrium points, we need to find the values p for which p prime is equal to zero. In other words, we need to solve the equation zero is equal to two p times one minus p times one minus three p. So the real numbers are, have a property or have a structure of an integral domain. I mean, oh, I spelled this wrong. Um, I mean, technically, technically speaking, you, you don't need to know this exactly, but feel free to look it up on Wikipedia if you want. What this means is that if a product of two things is equal to zero, it implies that either uh, A is equal to zero or B is equal to zero, and possibly both. Um, not all objects you work in mathematics may have this property, but the real numbers do. So this is useful when solving equations such as this one, since zero on the left-hand side implies that one of these terms needs to be zero. So this thing implies that either two p is equal to zero, one minus p is equal to zero, or one minus three p is equal to zero. That is, the solutions are p is equal to zero, one, or one third. And then these are the equilibrium points. I'll say, like, to save time, these are the equilibrium. Um, equilibrium points. I'll just put a box around this to make it, to make it clear to anyone who might be grading this what, what these things were. Okay, and now we need to determine the stability of these things. So there's, there's loads of ways of determining stability. Uh, one way would be to graph the function. And in this case here, it's, it's simple enough that this is possible. Another way would be to try and do like positive or negative justifications of this function. Like for example, you might be able to argue that for certain values of p, this part here is positive and then this part might be negative and this part might be positive and then this implies the overall thing is negative, stuff like this. It's not always possible to do an argument like that, but in this case it would be. Another option would be to pick certain values. Uh, pick, like pick certain values of P in between the intervals, in between these, the intervals which are defined by these equilibrium points and and compute what what p prime is and then another way would be to compute the the second derivative um the equilibrium points. So all of these are sort of valid. Not all of them are necessarily as easy to do as one another. It may not always be possible to do all of them. 
so it's really it's really up to you to sort of choose which ones you're most comfortable doing, which ones might be easiest for a particular problem, etc. So in this situation here, I reckon we go with the the fourth option. Let's compute the, the double derivative of this thing. Okay. Uh, where's my eraser? Here it is. Yep. So the second derivative of this thing is going to be the, <laughs> apologies, it's going to be the derivative of this thing. So there's a couple ways in which we could go about computing this. The easiest would be just to use an online tool such as Wolfram Alpha. Okay, assume this is in an exam so we don't have access to the internet. What would we, how could we do this by hand? We could try using a one of the rules from calculus. So in particular, in particular, the product rule says that if you have two functions f and g, which are differentiable, the derivative of their product is is equal to the kind of this this sort of like pairwise product thing. You know, like take a you, you take a sum of terms where each term contains the functions, and then you you just take the derivative of one of them at a time. Using this, you can prove that the derivative for, of a product of three functions is given by this thing. Oh, the prime is in the wrong place. If we would, and we could, we could potentially apply that, but that would involve a lot of a lot of calculation, right? We've got we've got three separate terms to compute, and then lots of terms within there. It's this looks too this looks too horrible. Okay, another option would be expanding out this polynomial first and then applying rules. And I think this will be, I think this is the way to go. So if we expand out the product of the second and the third term, I end up with 1 minus 3p minus p plus 3p squared. I can put together the the p terms here. And then this will give us uh, 6p cubed minus 8p squared plus 2p. And now we've got something that's much easier to apply the the polynomial derivative rules to. Okay, and now we just need to compute p double prime at zero, and then one and one third. At zero, this is going to give us two, which is greater than zero. At one, we end up with 18 times 1 squared, which is just 18, minus 16 times 1 plus 2. And this thing is going to be 4, which is greater than 0. And, oh dear, it looks like I've run out of space. Luckily, I can use this margin space up here. And at one third, we're going to get 18 times one third squared, which is 18 times one ninth minus 16 over three plus two. 18 divided by nine is two. Um, so 16 is 15 plus one. So this is going to be four minus five plus a third. And right, this thing is this thing is is going to be negative. Uh, so recall that if the slope of the tangent line at one of these equilibrium points is positive, or in other words, if the you know, if the value of the second derivative at those points is positive, we've got an unstable equilibrium.
Whereas if the slope of the tangent line at the equilibrium point of the function of p prime is negative, or in other words, if the double derivative at that point is negative, we've got a stable equilibrium. I should put a box around this thing just to, just to make it clear. It's part of A. Okay, and then that's part A done. So now we can move on to part B. If 5% of the mice have this new gene initially, what fraction of the population will have the new gene in the long run? I think for in a, in a case like this, it's useful to just draw a quick diagram of what's going on. So these are the equilibrium points. Since the equilibrium is unstable at zero and one, if we were to indicate with, you know, we would sort of change vectors, which direction these vectors are going, things are going to, uh, things are going to look like this. So the value of 5%, we, you know, normally we need to convert this into a, into a P value, but it's already been given to us. So that's about, that's about here. So we just need to follow the the, the 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 you know the trajectory of what happens to this point over time. If it's starting here, it's just going to it's going to increase to one third. Maybe it overshoots it a bit, in which case the sort of negative changes is going to just push it back down, and then it will kind of sort of oscillate and eventually stabilize to to one third. So we can say from the diagram. In the long run, the um, the population percentage with the new gene. I was gonna write with the mu gene. No, with the new. With the new gene goes to like thirty-three point three percent. I'm just uh, you know. 33.3% you know, is the percentage that corresponds to one third. You know, why am I writing this percentage instead of a fraction one third? The question is giving, the question is, you know, the value we've been given in the question is a percent. And so normally in questions, it's good to keep the units of the answer or the solution consistent with, with those of the question. And so... Okay, so that does part B then, and then for part C, what is the initial fraction? I mean, you know, what what if the what if the initial fraction is ninety percent instead of five percent? A similar kind of thing. Let's just identify in the diagram where ninety percent is. Ninety percent corresponds to the p value of zero point nine, which is about here. And so following the trajectory, it's just going to decrease to the same, the same point. So it's just you know, the same as above. All right, and then that concludes question one. Now we end up with question two. All right, this question is, is more difficult because it's more abstract. There's also the algebra involved is a bit more complicated. Please don't be angry with yourself if you found this problem to be difficult. Right, so we're asked to find the equilibrium points of this model and, and determine the stability. All right, so, so first of all, notice that the equation has this ln symbol in it. And this means the log function. Um, And in particular, it's the it's a special kind of log function. It has a value of the base is equal to this number e, also called Euler's constant. Uh, 
So in particular, when is this function defined? It's not defined on, on all values. So it's defined when x is, is strictly greater than zero, saying something like the natural log of negative one or the natural log of zero doesn't make sense. Since x here is the mass of a tumor, assuming the, the tumor has some mass to begin with, this equation then makes sense. The, the mass of this tumor is always going to be positive. It doesn't really make sense to say the, the tumor has negative mass. Uh, and so this equation is then defined for these points. Okay, so in order to find the equilibrium points, as in part A, we just need to solve. Solve x prime is equal to zero. That is x zero is equal to, equal to this thing. So we, we immediately might say, oh, you know, if x is equal to zero, of course this equation is equal to zero. And that, that is true. However, um, the equation is, is only defined when x is greater than is, is, is zero. So we should just note this. Um, we say x equals zero is not an equilibrium point. Since, uh, since x prime is not defined there. In particular, the natural log of zero is, is undefined. Okay, so if we want to solve this equation then, this really, this really means that we're solving we're solving for the second part. We're going to set the, the, the second part to be zero. Okay, so we need to solve zero is equal to K minus alpha natural log of X over X and one. Okay, so let's add this, this, this bulky term to both sides of this equation. This will then isolate the, the K. Uh, and then since alpha is greater than zero, this, this of course means that alpha is not equal to zero. So it makes, it makes sense to divide, not makes sense. It's okay to divide both sides by alpha. Okay, and then this part is, okay, so, so maybe you sort of got to this point if you tried to do the worksheet on your own. The next part isn't, I would say it's not totally obvious what to do for the next part. Okay, so notice that if I pick some number or if I have some relation such as A equals B, this then implies that you know, this, this next function holds. Yeah. So in a similar way, from the equation above, I get this thing. The exponential function and the logarithm are examples of what are known as inverse functions. And so this notion of inverse in of inverses in mathematics is is, is is ubiquitous. I think, you know, like in, in my sort of own research over the past couple of weeks, I must have read you know like, like twenty or so theorems which which involve notion notions of inverses. And so so generally in, in some in some really general sense and so because, they, because these things are so, are so general, I think it's, it's important for me just to, to talk about these for a minute or two. Or two. Um, so in a general sense, you have that like morphisms or maps or functions, whatever you want to call them. Um, these things are inverses 
if when you compose them together in whatever direction you get the identity function or you, or you get an, an identity. What does this all mean here? The identity function is the function which given a number or object, whatever you want to call it, x, it gives you back the same thing. So this function here, f of x equals x, is, is the identity function. Um, I, should, I should zoom on this. And so the fact that logarithm and exponential functions are inverses means that if you were to take a number, if you were to take something, put it into an exponential function, take the logarithm of that, you get by x. And likewise, when you compose them in this way, you also get x. So over here, this is this is exactly what we're doing. Where we're, we're taking some, we're taking some, we're taking the log of a function, and then we're putting it into the power. And so since those things are inverses, since those functions are inverses of one another, the left hand side is going to simplify down to down to this thing. Another way of writing this equation down here is that e to the power of log of x is equal to x. And that's that's exactly what I just what I've just used up here to get from that step to, to that step. And now if we multiply both sides of this equation by x naught, we get x is equal to x naught times this. Okay, and so we found uh, the only equilibrium point for, for this thing. And so now we need to determine if this is a stable or unstable equilibrium. So how do we go about this? Similar to the last problem, let's, um, let's draw, actually. So in the previous problem, we calculated the, we calculated whether these things were stable or unstable by taking the second derivative. This function here may look scary, but the second derivative actually isn't too bad. In order to do okay, so, so so let's just go ahead and try and calculate what the what the second derivative of this thing is. So the second derivative of this is going to be the derivative of um, So we can use the product rule to say this is going to be actually now I'm having now I'm slightly I'm slightly sort of I want to sort of stop doing this approach. It looks as though things are going to get quite messy if we continue with this. Okay. So this is like an example of Whereas we were able to take the second derivative of above in order to calculate things, it's going to get quite messy here. So let's try another. Let's try another strategy then. Uh, so we know that it has an equilibrium point at okay. Uh, what do we calculate at? x naught times e to the k of alpha. So if we were to draw a kind of sketch of this, end up with this thing. So if we can calculate 
if we can calculate the value of x prime in one of these sort of instants you know, for, for some value that's slightly less or it doesn't need to be slightly less which is just less than this value or greater than it this will then allow us to determine you know, if it's stable or, or unstable so how do we go about this you know this is already quite abstract to begin with one thing we can try and do is simply double this number so since this number is positive doubling will give us some some value over here and how do we double this? You know, just, just multiply by two, right? By definition. So let's try and plug in. Let's try and plug in this value into into x prime. So when x is equal to two lots of of this thing, x prime is going to equal. Like the algebra here is going to be messy. Um, so sometimes it happens in mathematics. <laughs> and, and by sometimes, I mean lots of times. So the reason why I doubled it is that is that like sort of doubling it isn't changing it. It isn't going to like in this case affect the algebra too much. It's not going to complicate things a, a lot. If if we if we were to instead multiply if we if we were to instead like add on some arbitrary number or you know like square it or do something like this, it would it would it would kind of be hard. The fact that we've doubled it means we get some cancellation cancellation here. So one rule that logarithms satisfy is that the log of a product of two function uh, of two numbers, say like the log of a times b, is equal to the log of a plus the, the log of b. Why am I saying this? Inside this log function here, we've got two times this thing over here. So this means that we end up with k times k minus alpha times the log of 2 plus the log of, you know, of e to the power of, of k over alpha. And since I noted before that the exponential function and the logarithm function are, are inverses of one another, it means this term here is just going to simplify down to down to green blob, no, it's going to simplify down to k over alpha. And then the alpha here is, is going to cancel with, is, if, we were to, if we were to expand this out further, I'm going to have to do this. Uh, I'm just going to erase the, this, this earlier stuff here to make, to make space. So we end up with x prime is equal to 2x naught e k of alpha. So let's expand this out. Alpha times log of 2 minus, minus k. So these things you cancel. And now we're left with, we're finally left, we're left with, you know, essentially the answer. Okay, so why on earth is this is this great? Why am I saying this thing is the answer? <laughs> Basically, like we, we can now figure out if this thing is positive or negative. So the question tells us that uh, that x and a are positive. 
So we know that this thing is positive. Uh, log of two is is positive. The log of the log like the log of x provided x is greater than one, the log of that thing's gonna be positive. Uh, the exponential function is always positive. X zero represents uh, a tumor, and negative two is negative. So if we multiply all of these things together, we get something that's that's negative. So this thing here is is less than zero. Aha! And so now we've calculated that since uh, we've calculated that the the derivative here is is negative, and so we've got an arrow here that's pointing in that direction. So then this is this is telling us that the point here is is um, is, is is stable. I mean, technically speaking, it may be the point. It may be the case that this point here is is semi stable. You know, in order to verify that the directions, the arrow is going here. If you want to be like pedanting about it, you could you can uh, modify the argument I just gave. Instead of instead of multiplying the value by two, divide by two, and then you'll get something that lies in this region. In fact, like in fact, like it's 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 not too bad to if we just like if we just track through what's going to happen when we do that. So the two which is here is now going to be on on the bottom. That is where more, that is this expression in the middle is one half times this thing. So this part is now going to be log of one half. Uh, and then we can just track that through. So if we were to divide by two instead of multiplying by two, this thing here is going to be the log of one half. And the log of one half is negative, which means that in the case that, um, so in that case, we would then have negative numbers here. And then we'd be multiplying, when we multiply all those together, we get something that's positive. And indeed, and indeed that's the case there. Okay, so that was, that was, that was, that was just me being a bit pedantic and, and super verifying that. That point is is indeed a stable equilibrium point. Actually, so I haven't written anywhere down here that it's stable. I should definitely do this. Um, hence, uh, hence x equals x naught e to the power of. Is a stable equilibrium. Okay, and guess what? We're not finished yet. That was just part A. <laughs> it's okay. The, the next part isn't too bad. Um, the next part is actually a lot simpler. How large will this tumor eventually grow? Well, given our diagram over here, Since there's only one equilibrium point, no matter what the size of the tumor is, eventually everything's going to, to head towards this equilibrium point. So we can say, uh, since there's only one equilibrium point at, I'm being a bit sloppy here, at x equals x naught, times e to the power of k on alpha, uh, which is stable. Um, the tumor will eventually grow to it. Uh, half an hour for midnight. I really need to need to finish this up. Okay, I really hope though that I've I've been trying to explain everything like, rigorously, because um, this question was this question is difficult. Okay, but that's the end of it. We're now in part three. So now we're back into a nicer world where we're not dealing with logarithms and having to double things in order to find specific values to calculate the equilibrium points. Okay, um, so this is the model that's that's called the Ali effect, uh, and we're asked to find the equilibri equilibrium points of it. 
And, and what do you know? We're given an equation which is a product of terms. So there's, there's no need to do all the fancy algebra of the last question. We can immediately solve this. We can say solving x prime is equal to zero implies that yeah, from the first part, either x is equal to zero, uh, and then from the second part, x is going to be k, or in the next part, x is going to be equal to a. Uh, and then, wait, and then that's part a done. Wow, we are flying, we're flying through this question. And then part B, uh, determine the stability of these and draw a phase portrait. You know, originally when I saw a phase portrait, I thought, you know, what does this mean? And then I realized embarrassingly that I had read this phrase several times in the, um, in the textbook. And I guess my brain had just filtered it out. Um, you know, you know, like the like the robots seen in Westworld do. Um, but you know, but then you know when it's in it when it's in an exam question, I realized, oh, this is something to take take care of. <laughs> I'm digressing here. Um, don't be worried. We've I've already done lots of examples of phase portraits. Uh, the phase portrait is is just this you know these diagrams here that that we've been doing. Okay, so how do we how do we do this one? Uh, let's mark down what the or what the points are. So you might be thinking, oh, you know, which direction is we? Where exactly do we plot uh, k and a? Are they greater than zero? Are they positive? Is k greater than a? Each of these would give us different diagrams. Luckily, the question specified uh, this extra information up here. So we know that both of these are positive, and in fact that uh, a is in between zero and k. Uh, and now we need to determine the stability of these things. Okay, so what would be the best method of doing this? We could try plotting this function. This might be difficult. We could try doing a similar argument as before with doubling stuff. But look, I've already put all of the, I put everything to that one, so let's skip that. We can try here doing a um, like negative and posi positive kind of argument. Okay, so we can say that. Uh, so why don't we do, why don't we do a table? Okay. So over here, I'll have the value of Rx. And in this table, I'm simply going to record if over certain ranges of x, for these individual functions, uh, the entire, the, whether for certain values of x, these things are, are positive or negative. I should say for certain ranges. So we can consider the case where x is, is less than zero, then we can consider the case where x is in between zero and, and a. We can then consider what happens when x is between a and k, and then we can consider what happens when x is, is greater than k. And then finally, we can take the product of all of them. Um, Oh, okay. you might be thinking, you know, what, is, what does this symbol over here mean? This is simply uh, notation for, for product. So that is, you know, if I multiply this part and this part and this part together, what's, what's the sign going to be? Okay, so let's think. So let's do, let's do this first part, this first column first. So R is a constant, and do we know do we know if R is positive or negative? Um, oh, it doesn't look like the question tells us this. Let's just assume R is positive. In that case, then, if R is positive and we're multiplying it by a negative number, this thing's going to be negative. And in all the other cases, this function is going to take a positive value. What about for the next column? When 
So looking at looking at this part of the fraction here, when x is less than k, so that is for all of for all of this part here, for all of these these boxes, uh, this fraction here is going to be less than one. If that fraction is less than one, it means that when we subtract it from one, we get something that's positive. And when it's greater than one, it's going to be negative. Okay, uh, third for the third column, we can apply. We can just think about this fraction uh, two. Uh, so when let's think when a is when a when x is greater than a, this thing is going to be greater than one, and so this thing is going to be positive. And x is greater than a in these boxes, so. And now we've, now we've filled out the, the hard part of the table. For the product, it's, it's sort of easy. We now just need to multiply all of these kind of numbers together. So let's just assume each of these are, are like negative one or positive one. Then we have um, negative one times negative one, which is positive, times a positive number. So this thing is positive. This thing's going to be negative. This thing's going to be positive. And this thing's going to be negative. And so now using now using these things we can we can fill in the we can fill in the arrows on here. So when x is less than zero, the x you know, we've got something that's positive, so it's going in this direction. When x is between zero and a, it's it's negative, it's then positive and it's then negative. And so looking at this, we can immediately see which of these are stable and which are unstable. Namely, for this first part here, since the arrows are pointing towards it, it's stable. I might just, since I'm feeling a bit lazy here, I just might write out the word stable and on. Green is kind of uh, associated to like a, a good color, right? So, uh... So then why did I write unstable? So the stable points are going to be this one and and this one. So that is x is equal to zero and k, and the other ones are going to be unstable. The unstable ones are going to be this one, and and I guess I guess that's it then. Uh, and then that's part C done. E, where's my where's my blue pen? Part C, what is the long-term behavior of this system? Make sure to describe all possibilities. We had a similar question in the first exercise regarding the mice. And in that, I, I think the percentages were 5% and 90%. And then we just you know looked at those points in the diagram. In this case here, we're not given anything specific, but we already have the diagram. And so provided we provided in our solution, we address all possible ranges. Um, you know, like we, then, then, you know, then we will, we will have sort of described all possibilities. Like that's the, the question is reminding us to, to do that. So we can simply say then when, um, okay, before I write down what these ranges are, let's just like actually figure out what, what's going, what's going to happen. Um, so when, when we have a point that starts less than zero, since zero is, is an equilibrium point, it's going to head towards it. Likewise, if something's less than a, it's going to head towards it. But in all the other ranges, the things are going to go to, to x instead. So we can say from, from the diagram, actually in this case, the, the question is giving us a, Diagram isn't fancy enough. Let's say face portrait from the from the face portrait. 
on, on I fancy. Uh, and the face portrait when when what are we doing? When X is less than A. Uh what exactly is gonna is you know, it's gonna head to zero, but maybe we need to use more precise language. Uh, it's just a general model, okay. I'm going to say the value of X. I mean, like, normally I'd say, you know, the, like, the population, the the percentage of this. In this case, it's just the the value of X goes to zero. And then we can say when X is greater than A, um, X goes to uh, goes to K. And then that's part C done. Oh wow, I've uh, we've we've nearly done this. And I can begin my late night TV binge. Um uh, so part D based on your previous analysis, what do the constants A and K represent? So we've got, so I guess like, I guess what I'm going to say is a kind of, is the textbook answer because, you know, I literally read this in the textbook a couple of hours ago. In the textbook, when this appears, it's, it's in reference to uh, animal populations. In particular, it says that sometimes in order for an animal population to sustain itself, there needs to be a minimum number of, of individuals. Otherwise, the the animal will just become extinct. It will just die off. Uh, and then this and this is this is what's happening in the in this phase portrait here. You know when the if 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 X is representing animal population, it says that if the population were to ever, you know jump jump to this point here like maybe maybe you know maybe the population normally lives around here and then there's some catastrophe some flash flood or something and then loads of individuals are wiped out maybe there's a disease and the population immediately jumps to here it's not going to recover it's instead just going to head towards zero and then likewise k is the um is like is an upper limit in which the population can support itself if the population were to if the animal population were to go higher than that, presumably there won't be enough resources, some reason like this, in which the animals will naturally die out and it will come back to K. So we could say, um, I mean, it, it's, since, this, since this model is quite general, it's, I think it's, it's a bit difficult to come up with a completely general answer where you could say, so we can say it's specified and we could say um, in the situation where X is modeling um, animal populations. A represents uh, a kind of minimal, like the minimum, um, yeah, what's, what's the best way to say this? A represents the, like the minimum, population needed. the species to survive and then we could say k is the um like the carrying capacity um, okay um yeah, uh, and then that that sort of that brings us brings us to the end.
so yeah, hopefully, hopefully you found this video useful. Um, there was a lot of, there was quite a lot of content in here and not just, not just necessarily direct contact from content from the course in particular, this second question and some of the algebraic tricks in there were, um, were a bit nuanced. Okay. Um, everyone have a good day.